So I have this feeling last week of what it was like when I was your age and Nixon was going down. It's eerily <laughs> reminiscent. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Um, all right, I should not get into politics in class, so I will refrain. Um, all right, so today we're going to start on a path that will lead us through uh, the next couple of sessions in the course, actually mostly the remainder of the course. We're going to talk about sources of information by which we come to know about the world. So if you look at an image like this and you see it's on a beach and there are a bunch of people there and uh, this is off in the distance and this is closer. Uh, so the question that we're going to try and deal with for the pretty much the rest of the term is how can we know that? All right, remember the problem that we have to deal with is that we don't have direct access to the environment. What we have is a optical projection of light that bounces off surfaces of the environment and enters into our eye. And that optical projection is highly distorted uh, relative to the things in the world. And so one of the questions we need to deal with is uh, to what extent are our perceptions of things in the world distorted? Uh, and to the extent that they're not, what's the information by which we're able to actually know that? Uh, now, this is a diagram which lays out sort of the basics of projective geometry. You've got a bunch of points in space, X, Y, Z. Uh, you've got points on an image plane or on the back of the eye, which is a 2D surface, right? So in order to describe points there, you only have two coordinates. And the basic idea here is that X prime on this surface uh, equals X over Z, Y prime equals Y over Z. So X prime, Y prime are coordinates on the receptor surface or on a window uh, or in an image plane whereas X, Y, Z are the coordinates of things in actual 3D space. So you're losing a dimension uh, ostensibly in this uh, initial projection. And so the question is, uh, given that we've lost so much information, how can we know anything about the world? And again, just to remind you about the types of distortion, we talked about this last time. Uh, if we vary the distance, uh, from an object, um, so for example, if I move my hand closer to you, uh, its optical projection gets bigger and bigger. As I move it away, the optical projection gets smaller. And similarly, if I rotate my hand, um, the projection gets compressed uh, when it's in this orientation relative to that orientation. All right, so these are, these are distortions that occur in optical projections that somehow uh, we have to deal with. Right? Not the only distortions, right? It's also the case of projections upside down. Uh, we see the world is right side up. So how do we pull that off? Now, if you look at a textbook on perception, you will likely, there'll be a, a small chapter on 3D vision, and uh, you'll likely see a list of things that are labeled as depth cues. I actually hate that term, and the reason I hate it is because it implies that you've got this little Sherlock Holmes in your head who's trying to reason about uh, all the information that is getting visually and, you know, induce some solution uh, to solve the problem. I don't think the brain works that way. Um, now, there are a number of, uh, if you look at the list of depth cues that you typically see in a perception book, they would include most of the things that I've shown you here. Uh, some of these are, turn out to be really powerful sources of information. Some of them turn out to be absolutely useless. Um, so the first ones on this list are pretty much useless. Uh, and from linear perspective down here to motion, um, they get much more, much more informative. Now, largely speaking, we will do a whole lecture, or in the case of Shading and Shadows, probably three lectures, uh, to look at how the brain uh, 
processes that information. So uh, as we'll be going through the course, I will be stepping through um, these, uh, these examples. So we will start off today, we'll talk about linear perspective. Uh, next time we'll talk about, actually I'm not sure what we talk about next time. It's either texture gradients or line drawings. I could imagine organizing it either way, but I'd have to look at the syllabus. Um, but today we're going to deal with linear perspective. But let me just talk about uh, some of these not useful cues uh, before we do that. Uh, so one of the ways we could do 3D vision in principle, and in fact in computer vision they do this all the time. Um, they have what are called, uh, they use stereo a lot in computer vision, and uh, you'll, if you read a paper on this, uh, they will always talk about having calibrated cameras. Um, unfortunately, humans don't have that. And let me explain what I mean. So, how many of your parents told you not to do this when you were a kid? And uh, did your mom tell you don't do that because they'll get stuck? <laughs> yeah, my mind told me that too. But uh, that my mom also told me that if I didn't wash, I'd get scurvy. <laughs> Years later, I asked her, I said, why would you make such a ridiculous claim? And she said, well, scurvy sounds like something you'd get from not washing. <laughs> My mom was like that. Um, so here's the idea. The idea is that, let's say I'm looking at you, and my eyes will be converged like so, as opposed to if I'm looking at somebody far away, my eyes will be pointing in a parallel direction. So in principle, if you knew the angle that the eyes were pointing, uh, you could use that information to trigonometrically calculate how far something is away. So if you're building a machine vision system and if you have a camera, that's what they mean by a calibrated camera, right? It knows precisely which direction it's pointing in and it can use that information in order to determine the distance of objects. Now, for whatever reasons, biology has not given us calibrated eyes. Uh, in fact, we don't have any sensors in our eyes that tell us where our eyes are pointing. Uh, we're mostly pointing because we're trying to attend to a particular feature, right? So if I look at your nose, right, the information that's telling me my eyes are pointing in the right direction is that your nose is in the fovea of both of my eyeballs. Uh, but I don't have information of exactly what that angle is. Now the other source of information that people use is what's called uh, accommodation. So you folks, because you're young, have lenses in your eye. We talked about that earlier in the course. And when you're young, your lenses are pliable. And you have muscles in your eye uh, that can flatten or make the lenses more curved. And you can actually sense this for yourself. What I want you to do is hold up a finger, close one eye, hold up your finger, and I want you to move the finger as close to your eye as you possibly can, trying to keep it in focus the whole time. And can you actually feel a strain like muscle strain when you do that? Well, those are what are called the ciliary muscles, uh, which alter the shape of your lens uh, and allow you to focus on things that are near. Now, once you get to be about 40 years old, it turns out that the cells in the lens just keep growing and growing and growing. And they don't stop. And by the time you get to be about 40, um, the pliability of the lens is pretty much kaput and you can't really change its shape anymore. And this is the time when people wear uh, what are called bifocals. So you have one correction for short stuff because you can't uh, accommodate anymore. And then you have another correction for far stuff if you need it. Um, usually for guys, um, they go to the optometrist when their wife sees them reading a book like so. And there'll be some comment like, Honey, you know, your arms gonna, aren't going to get any longer. And uh, they go to the optometrist and they're told you have to wear, uh, um, I know this from personal experience. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> uh, they're told, ah, you've reached that time. 
time for bifocals. So trust me, by the time you're early 40s, this is going to happen to all of you. Um, again, in principle, uh, you could calibrate, if you knew the curvature of the lens to get something in focus, you could use that as a source of information about the distance of things. Now, people have done experiments to try, so here's an example of convergence angle is zero. Here you're looking at something really far away. Uh, and accommodation is minimum, the lens is flat here. And uh, here's a case where your convergence angle is 20 degrees, you're looking at something close to you, and you see the ciliary muscles have caused the lens to be more curved than it is up here. Um, now, on the, the way people test this is to eliminate all the other sources of information. What they'll do is they'll take like isolated points in the dark and have people try to judge the distances of those. Um, now again, the purpose of that is to eliminate all the other cues so you can just isolate uh, accommodation and convergence. And when you do an experiment like that, it's not like subjects are completely at random. There's some signal there, but I mean the errors are huge. They're like off by 50% or more. Uh, so to, the information we get from accommodation convergence is, is crude at best. Now the other uh, cue that you'll see in um, traditional textbooks on perception is what's called familiar size. So the idea here is what's the approximate size of a male human? Like height? Yeah. Five nine. What's the approximate size of a human female? Five. Something like that. Now, there's variance in that. There's variance in that, um, but you do have some knowledge about what the likely distribution of sizes is for humans in the natural environment, and in principle, you could use that as a source of information. Uh, there's a kind of um, reasoning called uh, Bayesian statistical analysis where you take that kind of knowledge into account to help you make more refined estimates of what uh, you're actually seeing in the world. Um, and many people have argued that we do stuff like that. But what does this image tell you? What do you see here? Let's pick on you again. What do you see here? A small woman, is that within the range you would normally expect a woman to be? No. Uh, but yet, if you had prior knowledge of how big women are, it's not likely that you would see a Lilliputian woman like that, but you're seeing it anyway. So this is an example where uh, familiar size isn't particularly helpful. There are other things that are telling you about her size, not your prior knowledge about it. Um, so you've all seen how this works. How is this drawing? Why does she look small like that? Go ahead. That's further away. She's much further away, right? So he's, this is Julian Beaver, and he's um, painted these letters. So this W is actually stretched way out uh, on the ground, but he's painted it so it looks like all these things are in the same image plane. Uh, in the same, at the same distance. And if that's the case, then she has to be a really small woman when she's not. So it's pretty easy to override what we know about familiar size. And in fact, uh, there are a whole lot of movies that I'm sure all of you have seen at some time which uh, take advantage of that. Uh, here's an example. Uh, what do you see here? In, sitting on a, in a, sitting on a chair. Now, which is more likely, to have a really big chair or a really small man? A really big chair. But that's not how you interpret it. And there's many, many, many grade B science fiction movie uh, that's based on that principle. Here's a good example. This is actually not a bad movie. Um, <laughs> The Incredible Shrinking Man from 1957. This is the kind of thing they would play at the drive-ins. So your grandparents would go to the drive-in to see movies like this and make out. 
I know that sounds gross, but trust me, it happened. Um, give you a sense of how that goes. The science fiction classic, the incredible shrinking man, one of the best sci-fi films of all time. That's the big chair. X-rays prove it beyond any doubt. Are you going out? Yes, for a little while. Where? Well, just to the corner, to the store. You'll come right back. Well, of course I will. Featuring <laughs> fantastic special effects. Um. Now, in this one, they at least explain where he gets his clothes from. It's, uh, there's a, he's living in a dollhouse. Now, that's, now, as I said, if you watch this movie, I mean, it's, from, it's black and white from the 50s. It's pretty hokey, but on the scale of bad movies, it's not that bad. This one, on the other hand, is um, not that good. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the theme of this one is that there's uh, this woman who lives in the desert of Arizona or someplace like that, and her husband is cheating on her with some hussy. And she's driving around trying to find where he's, where this cheating is going on. And then this spaceship comes down and the spaceship touches her. And all of a sudden she turns into a 50 foot woman. Uh, and apparently her clothes change at the same rate. <laughs> but uh, so we'll, we'll see a couple minutes of this one. of this one now I said this is even bad now what do you do if you come out with a really crummy movie that does reasonably well at the box office you make a sequel <laughs> and uh, so this is the one um, by Daryl Hannah I mean many years later 40 years later um, I'll play a short clip of this this one's much less hokey than the others. My story begins on a day not so different from any other. I suppose it could have happened any time, to any woman. Looking back now, I realize most 
normal voluptuous woman. <laughs> this one's a little bit more realistic with her clothes. <laughs> All right, I think we should cut this off before we get to something I don't want to show you. Um, now, there are a number of versions of this that people have used. Some of you, have, how many of you have seen uh, The Incredible Shrinking Woman? Uh, how about uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? And uh, my personal favorite in this genre is the Attack of the 60-Foot Centerfold. Uh, this was on YouTube probably for about 10 minutes, but uh, I, I managed to get a copy of it off there, but I would never show this in class. Um, now, can you think of another movie where they would use these similar techniques? Yeah, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Uh, so you got this problem in Lord of the Rings, right? Hobbits are these little guys, humans like my size, wizards much bigger, and uh, the actors are all about the same height. But somehow you have to convince moviegoers for however long that movie was in its entirety, like 13 hours, something like that, uh, that those things are all different heights. And so I have a movie clip that show you uh, how, how they did that. It's a technique they call force perspective. A traditional technique that's been used for years is force perspective, in which if you have two people of the same height and you want to make one of them look smaller, you simply take that person further away from the camera. So suddenly the camera is seeing somebody close at a certain height and somebody further away at a smaller height. Now the forced perspective technique is based upon a camera being static, restricted to movements of pan and tilt only. I did give a little talk to some of the guys about a week before they started, just the, the crew, about you know, the forced perspective and how it works. As long as I stayed behind it, you know, like this, I would appear to be behind the same thing that, you know, uh, that Lisa is sitting on. There's still a sort of wonderful immediacy about uh, the forced perspective process because you got it all on the camera. The difference between a hobbit and a human, it's like 0.75 is a hobbit to a human, which if you invert that, a person needs to be roughly a one and a third times further away than what they would have to be if they were really a hobbit. So if you wanted Frodo and, and Gandalf to be standing side by side and they're 10 feet away from the camera, then you would want to put Frodo one and a third times further away than that. We also used a lot of um, duplicate set work and prop work uh, for different scales of people to act against. We really just used a, a slide rule and um, scaled up and scaled down accordingly. Some examples of this are uh, Bag End and Terrier, where we built two versions of the same set, exact replicas of each other, at two different scales. A large size scale for Ian Home to appear in, and a small scale, a hobbit size scale, for Ian McKellen to walk through. Primarily on the small set, you know, we, we had to, to spend days and days and days filming. And what was essentially like filming in a submarine? You know, it was that crammed and that uh, small, Everything that we did almost had to have several scales to accommodate and make this illusion come across on screen. Every book at the bookshelf of Bag End, every piece of parchment, every prop had to be built, perfectly replicated at two different sizes. We would build um, Gandalf's cart in two different scales and, and also had a force perspective split rig on it so that you could get Gandalf and Frodo sitting side by side, apparently. Although, in fact, Elijah Wood was sitting much further back from the camera than, than Gandalf, and you just pull the illusion off by the way you stage the scene. Whatever you did, you've been officially labeled a disturber of the peace. <laughs> so I have another one that talks about how they do this in motion, but I'll, I'll leave that to you to watch on your own. The, um, but the basic idea is the same. The your knowledge about the sizes of people aren't really helping you. Uh, you're using the information that's telling you about distance in order to gauge the sizes. Uh, 
or you're using the relative sizes of different things in the context where you're looking. So uh, even though they list it in most of the textbooks as a depth queue, it, it's not really doing much. And that brings us to linear perspective, which we talked about last time, uh, which is another powerful source of information about 3D shape. Um, so the idea here is that parallel lines in the environment will converge at a single point on the vanishing, uh, on the horizon. Uh, and we can actually uh, exploit that in order to calculate the real shapes and distances of objects. Now, um, there are a couple of other things going on that are related to linear perspective, uh, and they're also related to that bias that we talked about a week ago, where is this is very strong assumption that objects are resting on the ground. All right, we can exploit that. And uh, there's also a lot of information about, uh, that comes to us from the horizon. So the horizon is where all the parallel lines converge with one another. It's sort of an optical infinity. And the interesting thing about the horizon, if we're just standing up straight, the horizon is at our eye height, right? So if I were on an infinitely plat, flat plane, and I'm just standing looking straight ahead, the horizon would be at the exact height that I am. That's an important property of the horizon. Now what that means is, let's suppose that I'm looking at a tree out in the distance and the horizon cuts that tree exactly in half. So half the tree is above the horizon, half the tree is below the horizon. What could I say about the size of that tree? How high is the horizon? It's my eye height. If the horizon cuts the tree in half, that means half the tree is above my eye height and half the tree is below my eye height. All right, so the tree would be exactly twice the height of my eye. Now notice that would be true whether I'm a seven foot person or a five foot person. All right, so that information is scaled to the height of the observer. So which of these objects is taller, this one or that one? How many of you say this one? Raise your hand. How many of you say this one? Raise your hand. All right, those, why do you think this one is taller? because a higher percentage of it is above the horizon. This one, the horizon cuts it in two. This one, the horizon's cutting it about one-fifth. All right, so what this is telling us is that this object is probably about five times bigger than this one. Even though in the projection, this is actually the bigger one because it's so much closer and its retinal image is expanded because of that. Now, the other thing we can tell from this is uh, which object is farther away, this one or that one? How many of you say this one's farther away? How many of you say that one's farther away? All right, now the information here is how close is the base to the horizon? Remember, the horizon's at infinity. So if the base is really close to the horizon, that means that object is really far away. If the base is far away from the horizon, that means it's closest to us. All this assumes that the object is resting on the ground. Actually, before I go further, let me back off one second, and I want to give you a general strategy that we're going to be following uh, for the next several weeks in this course on how one goes about doing vision research. All right, so what's the basic problem? The basic problem is the stimulus for vision is a pattern of light on the back of the eye. But I could care less about patterns of light on the back of the eye. What I want to know about is objects in the environment. 
So here's the key that we're going to try to do to understand vision. And it's the same if you're a perceptual psychologist or you do computer vision. It's the same basic idea. So what we're going to try to find is some properties that we can measure in the pattern of light with some reasonable set of assumptions about how the world is constrained, like objects are resting on the ground, uh, that would allow me to make a computation of some 3D property, like how big the object is relative to my eye height, for example. All right, so in this case, what is it we're measuring? Uh, here, the measurement we're doing the image is where does the horizon cut the object in terms of its vertical position? And that's going to tell me about its size. All right, and then I have an algorithm that says the horizon's at eye height, and so if half is above and half is below, that means the object is twice as high as my eyes are. All right, the idea is what we're trying to do is find a measurement of things in an image from which we can derive properties of the world based on some reasonable set of assumptions about constraints on those properties. Now the devil in the details, the, the, the thing where these models almost always go wrong is that they make an assumption that is completely bogus. There's a, a joke I told one time. I was giving a talk at a conference um, years ago, and um, uh, I told a joke about these two, uh, three computational modelers who were out hiking in the woods, and uh, they get trapped in a deep pit. And two of them were from Midwest universities, and they were all completely upset because in the middle of nowhere, and they know they're going to die. And the other one had just gotten his PhD in uh, AI from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he said uh, I know how to get us out of this pit this is another great example of where computational modeling can come to the rescue and the other two guys go oh well, how can you do that he says it's easy first we assume we have a ladder <laughs> so um, uh, one of the senior person, people in the field asked me if I'd ever told that joke at MIT. And I said, well, no, I'd never given a talk at MIT. And as it turned out, I was invited to give a talk at MIT like three weeks after that. So I, I, I go to give this talk. And uh, uh, so of course I had to tell the joke. <laughs> um, how many of you have heard of Steve Pinker, the author? Uh, so he's a famous science author. He was a young guy back then, and uh, he was sitting in the audience. And um, so I start off my talk by telling that joke, and I ended up, and the room is completely silent, except for Steve Pinker, who's laughing his butt off. <laughs> <laughs> so I've bought all his books since then, but. Uh, yeah. uh, that's the problem we're gonna run into with these models. Uh, the question is, we need to make assumptions about regularities in the environment uh, in order to, to get anything done. But if the, in, if the assumptions are too fanciful, we'll come up with a model that could work in principle, but it's never going to work in practice because the thing you've assumed is never really going to happen. So let's apply that analysis here. What are we assuming here? The only assumption that we're assuming is that the object is in contact with the ground. That's, that's a pretty robust assumption. Uh, you can go a long way with that assumption. Uh, so in this case, the underlying assumption is perfectly reasonable. But we still have, if we ask the question, uh, is this the information that people actually use? We have to do experiments in order to test that. And so what we'll be doing throughout this course is I'll present lots of models like this. We'll talk about the assumptions, whether the assumptions are reasonable or not. And then we'll also talk about the empirical data uh, where we go in and test, is this the kind of thing, do, do people behave in the way that we would expect a model to behave? All right?
So if we want to talk about which one's farthest, it's which object is closest, um, has its base closest to the horizon. That's going to be the one that's farthest away. Now there's an interesting experiment done by um, Shana Rogers, um, who's at, what university is she at? It's in Virginia, Madison University, something like that, in any event. Um, so she gave observers displays like this, and there's a standard object, so this is something that you can't change. And then they're allowed to adjust a test object that's here. And so what they're asked to do is to adjust the height of this object so that it appears to be the same 3D height as the one over here. So if uh, observers can make use of the horizon ratio, uh, then they ought to be able to do that. And lo and behold, oh, she ran two conditions, one where the objects were uh, above the horizon and one where they were all completely below the horizon. And here's what her data look like. So the solid line is what you would expect with perfect performance, all right? So this is if they were making these judgments with perfect accuracy. Uh, and the subjects are pretty close to that, as you see here. This is two subjects. Um, the dash curve is one and the solid curve is the other. Uh, the data are a little bit more variable, a lot more variable in the uh, high standard but at least one of the subjects is nailing it perfectly, the other one is underestimating it by a good deal. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we're gonna be doing throughout, right? Again, I'll describe a particular model and uh, then we'll run experiments to see if we can get any empirical evidence about whether uh, humans are doing that or not. And the more interesting cases is where there are multiple possible models and we can try to tease them apart uh, through empirical research. So here's another example study that looked at the, uh, how close the base is to the horizon. Um, how many of you think these two things look like they're the same size? Which one looks bigger? Uh, that further one? This one looks like bigger? And that just looks like it's a bowl. All right, now if you, if you go in Photoshop and you match these up, they're exactly the same size, right? So that size distance is an illusion. And what is it that's providing that illusion? Yeah? Well, I was just going to say, isn't that why the moon does appear to be larger when it's on the horizon? Uh, that's why the moon, well, I should be careful about that. That's one possible explanation. There are probably about 20 explanations for the moon illusion. That's the one that I think is most plausible. Um, but there are lots of other ones out there, which I just assume not get into. But uh, uh, the answer to your question is yes, but not everyone would agree with that. Um, so anyway, what you're exploiting is the idea that because the base of this is closer to the horizon, uh, that means the thing is farther away. And if you have two things that are the same size, one's farther away than the other one, then the farther away one must be bigger. That, that's, that's the logic. And this experiment was done by a group at um, Berkeley, and they used a set of displays like this where they had these balls. Uh, they could either be on the ceiling or on the floor, like you see here, and uh, they would be presented with a pair of them, say this one and that one, and you would be asked to, or say this one and that one, and you would be asked to judge which one looks closer. And what they find was, um, I'm not gonna go through all the details, it's a fairly complicated slide, but that the data could be predicted perfectly by where the base of the object was relative to the horizon. Now the wrinkle on here is that you get the opposite effect for objects on the ceiling than you do for objects on the floor. But what all this points to is that um, this idea about how objects are related to the environment does indeed uh, 
seems to be a source of information that people actually use. All right, what I want to get into now is an interesting thing about linear perspective. Remember we talked last time that you can see a picture in two different ways, either as a picture or as the thing that's depicted in the picture. Now, if you see the thing depicted in the picture, and let's say the picture was done using correct linear perspective, um, there's a problem. And the problem is, from linear perspective, you can calculate what the size and shape of the object is in the picture, but only if you're looking at the right vantage point. All right, so let's see if I can express this. So suppose I take a picture of you from right here, all right? And now I, I blow up the picture, and so from the camera, you have a particular visual angle that the, that the camera is seeing. And if I do the picture so that you look at it from exactly the same visual angle, it ought to specify your exact distance and size. The problem is, if you look at it from any other viewing position, um, linear perspective will give you a wrong answer. So for example, when you go into a movie theater, it ought to make a difference if you're sitting in the front row or the back row, or if you're sitting on the side or sitting in the center. Now most people, when you go into the movie, I mean, you know, maybe if you're in the front row and off to the side, it looks a bit weird, but most people think it doesn't, their perception of the movie doesn't change that much, uh, depending on where you sit. And so this is a problem that people have worried about for some time. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of this as we go along. So here's the idea about the viewing angle. So suppose I take a picture of this surface from this position and this visual angle. If I observe it from this position, you ought to see the correct shape of the surface. Or at least uh, there is a model that exists that would tell you the correct shape of the surface. However, that model also predicts that if I look at it from a different visual angle, like so, then the apparent shape of that surface should be distorted. And so the question is, does that happen when we look at pictures? Now, there's an uh, experiment done by uh, uh, Jeff Saunders and Ben Backus in 2006. And I'm not going to derive this from you, you just have to take my word for it, but let's talk about the model that they proposed. So there are two visual angles that you have to measure. One is the tangent of this visual angle here, this distance there, uh, and the other is the tangent of um, this visual angle here, A. And so what their analysis says is that, uh, so let me back off here. This is slant, right? So that's a slant of zero, that's a slant of about 45 degrees. This is the thing you're trying to compute. It's a 3D property. I don't have access to the 3D property. All I have is access to the image. All right, so I'm trying to compute the slant S. That's the thing I wanna know. What I'm given is W, which is a visual angle, the width of this thing, and uh, uh, this angle, which is the angle of convergence, A. Mm -hmm. And what Sanders and Back has showed is that if we, uh, using this equation right here, uh, we can actually calculate the slant S, which is the thing we're trying. Now, I, I don't expect you to understand where that equation came from, what I do expect you to understand is that uh, it is possible to compute the slant of a surface um, from visual angles that you measure in the image uh, when you have perspective images of uh, objects with parallel lines that are converging at the horizon. Now, one of the interesting predictions of this model is that you should get huge effects, 
of looking at, so let's say I look at a picture of this, uh, but this is, these visual angles are bigger than they ought to be because I'm, I'm too close or smaller because I'm too far away. What this model predicts is that that ought to drastically affect your perception of slant. And so Bacchus, or Sanders and Bacchus did an experiment to try and test to see if that would happen. Um, now, this experiment's a little bit complicated because they didn't really measure slant directly. They had subjects adjust the shape of the object. Uh, so if you know the shape, you can determine the slant, and if you know the slant, you can determine the shape. Um, but nonetheless, they can, um, they can figure out what, what you're doing both with respect to slant and what, what you're doing with respect to shape. So here we have a high slanted condition uh, where you just have the outline or you have a texture inside. This is a low slant condition. Um, and here's... Um, some of the different aspect ratios that you get for different shaped objects. Uh, but let's go straight to the data. Here's what the data show. If you were using their model, then what that predicts is that the subject's judgments ought to follow this dashed line here. And you notice that as the projected size of the image changes, you should get large changes in the apparent slant. That's what the model predicts. However, if you look at the data, there's a little bit of effective size, but not very much. And the data aren't really following this curve at all. So the moral of the story is that whatever subjects are doing, it's not solving that equation. Uh, they're doing something else. I'll come back in a later lecture and I'll tell you what they're doing. But uh, for our purposes now, the main thing is, is that we can take this model, generate a prediction from it, and that is if I take an image and I vary the size of the image, the model predicts you ought to get drastic changes in the apparent slant and the apparent shape. We run an experiment to test that. The experiment shows that doesn't happen. And as a result, we disconfirm that model. So whatever subjects are doing, they're not doing this. And the other thing is, is projected size has a much smaller effect than suggested. So um, our perceptions really are hardly affected at all as you look in the front row of the theater or the back row of the theater, which is a good thing, and that's probably what we experience when we, we view it. Now, there's another aspect of this problem that I want to highlight from you, and that's this one right here. I need a volunteer. Shall I just pick somebody? Let's pick on you. Okay? You need to stand up. All right, I want you to stand here. Look at, no, right there. Look at the image. Where's Uncle Sam pointing? At me. Okay, now walk towards me. Keep looking at Uncle Sam. At me. Where? He's still pointing at you? Yeah. You can see this in the eyes. He's looking at you here. Now walk to the other side. He's looking at you the whole time? Yep. How can that be? <laughs> That's a perfect answer. Um, all right, so one theory about this, anybody wants to get up and walk around, you can see this before. They do, uh, they actually, they play a joke on this in some old movies, you know, where they have a gorilla or something, and the Abbott and Costello will be looking through the eyes of the gorilla, and then they, their eyes really do change with the observer. But... Uh, um, so the question is, how can this happen? So there's one model that says, uh, well, your brain is mentally rotating the object as you walk. So obviously the image isn't changing as she walks from here over there, right? So whatever's causing that pointing to be directed at her, 
uh, is in her perceptual system. She gave the right answer. It is perception. But the question is, how does that happen? So one way it could happen is that her brain is like mentally rotating the object. And uh, uh, I did an experiment a number of years ago that looked at this with my good friend Jan Kunderink. Um, and uh, so the stimuli we used uh, look like this. It's a medical mannequin. And the task that we used, oh, so this is looking at it straight on. And this is looking at it at an angle. How do they look different? Uh, no, this is an actual, so this is, this is a picture where you're looking at the frame straight on, and the second one is a picture where you look at the frame at an angle. We also did the similar case where you looked at the figure straight on, but then in the simulation we simulated it at an angle. Um, so do these two look exactly the same? What's different about them? and a little thinner. All right, so basically what's happening here is that your brain is not rotating the object, it's just squishing it. All right, so if I'm pointing at you like so, and we look at it from an angle, right, what's the angle gonna see? Pointing at you like so, but the rest of me is squished a bit. And that's what we were able to show. So this is the condition where you're looking at a normal image from an angle. And uh, oh, we also have a case I didn't show here where you have a, um, we compensated for that so that we stretched the image to make it bigger so that when you looked at it at an angle, it would have the same proportions as this. And it turns out it didn't make any difference. So when subjects do these judgments, what looks like it's facing forward always looks like it's face. So the, the orientations of the points never change. It's just how, whether they're squished relative to each other. Um, so the moral of the story is that whatever we're doing, this, this, our perception of pictures is a little bit weird. If we were using the correct information you could get from linear perspective, then things ought to distort like crazy if you look at it from the wrong angle or you look at it from the wrong distance. And it turns out whatever people are doing, um, they're not doing that, right? So when we change viewing distance or we change viewing angle, our perception doesn't change that much. Uh, a little bit, but not nearly as much as you would expect if we were using linear perspective. Now the stuff with the horizon ratio we're clearly using, which is an aspect of projective geometry, but uh, we're doing something different in, in other respects. Oh, here's the one where we adjusted. So this one, if you look at it from an angle, you'll get the same proportions you see there. And if you look at the data, so what the subjects have to do here is they are judging the local orientation at each point. So they have a marker like this that they have to set it so it just looks like it fits on the surface. Notice this one looks like it fits, that one clearly doesn't. And they do this probe points all over the object. And then we can actually reconstruct the 3D shape from that. And here's what the data look like. The, they're almost the same in every condition. Uh, so the depths aren't changing. The only thing that's changing is the distances in the image point. Now that gets us to, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get out really early today. Well, maybe not too early. There is another kind of perspective. So one of the chapters that I gave you uh, had a discussion, it was by uh, the guy uh, Willits, is an uh, art historian, uh, particularly good art historian, and uh, 
one of the chapters I gave you was approaching this from an artist's point of view. Artists use all kinds of different perspectives, not just linear perspective. Uh, linear perspective is largely confined to, well, I should, uh, traditionally, uh, that was used in Western art, whereas in Eastern art used a projection that looks more like this. It's called orthographic projection. So remember, in, uh, projective project or central projection, um, if we have x, y, z in the world, that maps onto the image plane of x prime equals x over z, y prime equals y over z. In orthographic projection, you just drop the z x prime equals x, y prime equals y. And you say, well, why would you do that? Well, it turns out this is not a bad approximation if you're looking at stuff with small visual angles that's far away. The effects of perspective sort of get vanishingly small the farther away things are and the smaller the visual angle you look at it with. Um, and orthographic projection is a good um, description of that. So if we look at the kinds of effects I showed you in this slide earlier, in um, polar central projection, when you vary distance, the sizes change. When you vary orientation, the shapes change. In orthographic projection, this goes away, but you still retain that. So in orthographic projection, you still have variations in the shape of elements, depending on how they're oriented but you don't get any variations in distance. Why do I have two identical slides? I have no idea. Um, now I know people don't do this anymore. Have any of you, we got a bunch of engineers in here, any of you taken a course in mechanical drawing? All right, what kind of projection you use? Yeah. The NOSU in, in 1181, which is the instruction engineering, they teach orthographic and isometric drawing. Right. This is much more convenient if you're doing things like blueprints, right? So you want the distances that you draw to be the actual distances that the objects are going to have, right? So if uh, I'm, I'm showing a wall and the wall's 10 feet, I want everything to be to scale which you don't get in polar projection, but you do in orthographic projection. Uh, and this would be an example of some of those drawings. I remember when I was a freshman in engineering, um, we had a guy on my floor, who, I was really terrible at this, especially lettering. I really sucked at lettering. And we had a guy on my floor who could knock these off in like five minutes flat. And he did the drawings for everybody in my dorm. He'd sell them for five bucks a pop. It was well worth it. Um, you also see this in um, Chinese and Japanese art. Um, now, one of the things about this kind of projection is it preserves affine structure. So, uh, unlike polar projection, uh, parallel lines in polar projection don't stay parallel in the image, right? They converge toward the vanishing point. Uh, but in uh, Eastern art, classical Eastern art, uh, parallel lines are preserved. And so this is a good example of that um, drawing from the tale of Genji. Uh, and as you see, uh, parallel lines all stay parallel. They're not converging like they would in a drawing from linear perspective. Here's another example. Again, you see the parallel lines are staying parallel. You wouldn't get that in uh, Western art. But it works fine. I mean, it, 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 it's a beautiful work of art. Uh, it captures what you want it to capture. If you're doing engineering, it actually turns out to be much more convenient to do it this way. Um, and there are other projections that people use as well. All right, so the projections that people use in art are a convenience or a preference. Um, if we look at these two kinds of projections in vision, 
it turns out to be the case that there is a continuum. So when I look at something with a, right, if I get really close to you, so I'm looking at you with a big visual angle, um, there's a lot of perspective. Um, if I look at somebody in the back row where the visual angle is much smaller, the amount of perspective goes way down and it quickly approximate, uh, approximates an orthographic projection. Uh, so a lot, because the mathematics of polar projection is more complicated, a lot of people will uh, simplify, uh, do their models based on orthographic projection and uh, the, con the restriction there is it's only really valid for looking at things with fairly small visual angles. Um, I will talk much more about this aspect uh, when we talk about texture. Does somebody have a copy of the syllabus handy? So what's on schedule for next week? Am I doing contours or texture? Um, October 1st, shape from texture and analysis of line drawings. Oh, okay, so I will do texture. Texture is, we'll see, it's a generalization of um, linear perspective. And when's the first exam? It's uh, a week from Tuesday? October 8th. Okay. Um, all right, I will let you go now. We will do a follow-up of very related material next time. Again, let me emphasize the key concept that I want you to walk away with this, and that is we're going to propose models of how you calculate 3D things from measurements that you take in an image, and then we're going to look at experiments that try and assess to what extent are humans using those particular kinds of measurements in order to make judgments about 3D shape, or are they doing something else? Any questions about this before I let you go? All right, I will see you uh, next week. Have a good weekend. Um, we'll see if we have the same